whole. It includes over 40, over 40 countries, has more ethnicities than countries, and over 2,000 languages. Currently, there are over 6.1 million Asians that call Canada home. So if we look at the Canadian census of defining what Asian is, it breaks it down into five categories. That's Central Asians, which can include people from Afghan, Armenia, Georgia, uh, Mongolia. East Asians, which include Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese. Southeast Asians, which include Burmese, Filipino, Singaporean, and Vietnamese as an example. South Asians, Indians, Maldivians, Sri Lankans. And the West one, West Asians, is a little bit contested as it really depends on what these individuals self-identify as. And that's West Asians. So West Asians are people from Bahrain, Israel, Kuwait, Oman, UAE, etc. So as with many areas of DIEB, the dialogue and content is forever changing and evolving and our understanding of terminologies might change. But with that being said, I hope that this really gives you a bit of context into defining who counts as Asian. Thank you, Michael. I know when we were preparing for the panel, I wasn't sure. So that's a really great explanation for everyone who's on the call today. So we'll continue on uh, with our, our introductions. So we'll go through and if you can please share your name, your role, your company and your, your pronouns. Um, so I'll start us off. My name is Carolyn Seward. I'm with the Career Connections team at the Insurance Institute of Canada, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, so we will move over to Richard. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Sanchez. I'm a senior property and marine claims specialist at Zurich Canada, and I'm based in our Toronto office. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Xiao Tan. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am Xiaotang Gao, Data Analytics Consultant from CNA. My pronouns are she, her, and also calling from Toronto. Great. And Catherine? Hi, I'm Catherine, uh, but my official name is actually Meng Shan Chen. I'm a farm underwriter at the Wawani Nisami Insurance Company. Uh, I use she, her, and hers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And Yosef? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Yosef Paul Yorl. I go by the pronouns he, him, and his. I'm a director at Dejardin, uh, working in the company's auto physical damage claims department. I've uh, been in the role since January 2020, and it's uh, nice to be here. Looking forward to our, to our chat. Great. And Michael, we got you, right? We did. Okay, great. So we're going to get us warmed up, and we're going to do very fast questions. So first question is coffee or tea? Shaotan, go. Coffee for work, tea for leisure. Okay. I've drunk tea for a while. <laughs> and Yosef, coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee? Okay. Uh, early morning or late night? Catherine, go. Uh, actually, when I was young, it's early. Uh, uh, it's late night, but now it's early morning. Sorry. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Richard? <laughs> early morning for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Michael? Late night, hands down. Oh wow. Okay, great. So now that you're you're warmed up, we'll we'll continue on. So our first question is for all of you. And you know, the Asian community is so large and diverse that we want to shine a light on the individual cultures of each region and some of the different nuances found within them. So can you share a bit about yourself and your cultural heritage? So we're going to start with Michael for this one. Yes, thank you. So a little bit about me. I'm a fifth generation Chinese Canadian, and I have deep roots within representation and activism. My great great grandpa arrived in the late 1870s. He actually arrived in Nanaimo, BC. And immediately upon arrival in Canada, he was faced with racism, as he was viewed as unfair labor competition within the local mines. Later on in his life, he actually became the first non-Caucasian person to own land in BC. It was 43 acres, and that resulted in becoming Nanaimo's first Chinatown. So um, that's a little bit about my history. I was born and raised in Victoria, BC, and have lived in various parts of the world, including uh, Vancouver, London, and now Toronto. Thank you, Michael. So next, we'll hear from Yosef. 
Sure. So uh, I was born and raised in the Philippines. Uh, my family and I moved to Toronto in 1993. I'm proud to say that this June, we're going to be celebrating our 30 years in this amazing country. It's been an honor and a privilege just living in Canada and, of course, living in one of the most diverse and multicultural cities in the world in, in Toronto. Um, and just about our cultural her heritage, I'll say that uh, us Filipinos, we're all about community, togetherness, family. We're a, a very welcoming, inquisitive culture, and we take pride in fostering that, that sense of belonging in any way that we can. Uh, a key saying in Filipino I'll share is, is called kainna, uh, which translates to, uh, to let's eat. Food plays a, a huge role in, in our societal norms and cultures and, um, and customs, I should say. And if you're entertaining anyone at home, it's customary to, to offer up the words kainna just as a means of uh, welcoming your guests and, uh, and making them feel at home by uh, offering them something to eat. And maybe just on a lighter note, uh, as Filipinos as well, we're fond of nicknames. Um, there's, uh, if you meet a Filipino and you hear their family member call them a name, it's probably not going to sound like their regular name. So my relatives don't call me Joseph or Joseph Paul. I'm known as Jopo. So if you want to call me that, you're welcome to. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely feel at home. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. So Xiaotan. Um, I was born and raised in Beijing and uh, came to University of Toronto for undergrad. Um, our family loves nature and animals. We have two cats, one pair, two birds, two turtles, and 11 fish. Wow, that's great. Okay, Richard. Oh, thank you, Caroline. I'm a relatively newcomer to Canada. In 2020, at the height of the pandemic, my wife and I decided to leave our respective careers in the Philippines, and we took the leap of faith and move here in Canada. And that turned out to be one of the best, if not the best decision of our lives. We've been so fortunate to find suitable occupations here in Canada, both in the insurance industry. And we, most importantly, we've been blessed with our first baby, who we are very thrilled and excited to welcome this summer. And just to share also my cultural heritage, um, same as millions of Filipinos. I am a avid basketball fan. I am a practicing Catholic. I value strong family ties. And in terms of food, I love our pork adobo, which is pork stew in soy sauce and vinegar, as well as our pancet, which is our local noodle with mixed vegetable. And last but definitely not the least, I love our Jollibee's Chicken Joy Fried Chicken. Great. Thank you, Richard. Catherine? Hi. Um, I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, but I went to U.S. when I was 14, and I finished my four years high school and university there. After I finished my university, I decided to go back to Taiwan to be with my family. So after being working at the different computer companies in Taiwan for a few years, I decided to apply for working holiday visa. It's a one-year visa to come to Canada in 2011, and of course, I stay here since then. <laughs> so the years I spent in North America, and that I noticed that many people are not really familiar with Taiwan. As a manager for my previous job, at first, she saw that I was from Thailand. <laughs> so just want to let you know, Taiwan is actually a very small island. <laughs> so that's also uh, why and she wasn't the only one uh, to mistaken that at first. Um, but Taiwan actually has learned earned some spotlight lately due to the worldwide chipset shortage during COVID-19. Uh, then people realized that Taiwan has actually a company called TSMC, which uh, produced more than 60% of chipset worldwide. Um, Taiwan's about the size of Vancouver Island and has a population of over 24 million people. And 70% uh, of the land were like mountains. So you can imagine how proud it can be. So that's the main reason why I decided to move to Canada. Mm, and something about Taiwan, Taiwan uses traditional uh, Chinese, which versus China use simplified Chinese. But we do share similar background and culture. And I have some fun facts about Taiwan, which some people might already know, some people might not know. So the bubble tea actually was invented in Taiwan. And Taiwan actually has 16 indigenous, indigenous groups. 
and the founder of TNT Supermarket, Cindy Lee. She's actually originally from Taiwan as well. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, we are going to kick it off with our first question. I'll go for Xiao Tang. What does it look and feel like to be a part of the insurance industry today as someone who identifies as part of the Asian community? Um, thank you for your question, Michael. Um, I like the fact that companies as well as insurance industry are intentionally fostering Asian-centric conversations and celebrating our stories and ex experiences. In Susan Cain's book titled Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Cannot Stop Talking, there is one chapter on Asians and he writes, Asians are not uncomfortable with who they are, but are uncomfortable with expressing who they are. I think this is precisely uh, where companies can play a pivotal role in helping their employees break the invisibility. Champions could proactively promote Asians' presence through branding and marketing Leaders could address the gap by providing mentorship opportunities to help minorities see themselves in roles we never considered. So the approach to develop diversity and equity programs has to be more nuanced to be relevant since Asian is such a broad term, as you mentioned. Um, but improvement doesn't have to start until a textbook is, is ready. Erasure of invisibility could start with calling the right name, not asking for an alternative name or spell checking a minority's name. And these conversations are equally essential to Asians, to us, because they educate us to recognize how our own identity subtly influence the way we interact with others and the bias we actually unconsciously hold that might shape others' experiences. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Chow Tong. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Yes, if I may share, Michael. Absolutely. Okay, so as a newcomer here in Canada, I had a fair share of rejections, frustrations, and heartbreaks in my job hunting journey. Um, though I'm international trained professional, most Canadian companies which I applied with preferred those with Canadian experience. And at that time as well, the height of the pandemic, companies were very keen on minimizing costs and we only hire if necessary. But when I tried and applied with insurance industry, the industry took a chance on me and it welcomed me with open arms and generous heart for which I'm very, very much grateful. And I also appreciate that our industry is one of the leading sectors and voices advocating and promoting diversity and inclusion across Canada. And for me, with prevalence of racism and hatred across the world today, it is very important to be part of an industry and like an organization like Zurich, which embraces multiculturalism provide equal opportunities, acknowledge and respect unique needs, and foster a culture where everyone, despite greed, color, preference, ethnicity, and other background, is welcome, valued, and recognized. So as a newcomer and as an Asian, I feel so welcome and valued in, this, in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So our next question is for Catherine. So Catherine, do you think there's any barriers to entry for the insurance industry? Right now, we, we know that uh, a lot of industries are really focused on finding talent. And of course, the insurance industry is, is one of them. We're definitely looking to grow. And uh, what do you think maybe some insurance companies could do in particular to try and attract more Asian professionals? Yes, absolutely. Especially, I think, for newcomers, just what uh, I want to echo what Richard just said. Yeah, especially for newcomers, sometimes, you know, the, the issue, the barrier would be the language skill might be the barrier to entry. 
also the lack of insurance related knowledge also will be another uh, factor. Um, but I think company can actually uh, by by doing like um, by hosting more career fair at the different university and colleges to reach out to like students or international students to let them know how um, how how to actually get into the insurance industry um, and also um, to uh, make them understand more about the insurance industry as well and also through like in internal referral program um, so the current agent employee are able to refer more qualified agent professional to join the insurance industry which of course Wawanisa is doing that all, all the time we do have like a, a referral program and also we actually I, our supervisor always go to all different kind of college fair the, um, to actually uh, reach out to the students Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. That's great. Yeah, hopefully events like this are helping as well to showcase representation within the industry. And, you know, we certainly have a lot of people on the call today who are already in the industry, but uh, hopefully we have some who are, are thinking about joining as well. And I know that um, we are seeing more companies recruiting from some of the different clubs that are on campuses. So a lot of universities and colleges will have different associations for their students and uh, we also see more specialty job boards reaching out to different communities as well. So, so lots of really great points there. Next question, Richard, you touched upon uh, discrimination and racism earlier. So we have movements such as Black Lives Matter, Every Child Matters, and the Stop, Asia, Stop Asian Hate campaign, which has really highlighted racism within Canada. If you're comfortable, could you share your feelings about the Stop Asian Hate movement? Absolutely, Michael. But let me start by acknowledging that the issue of racism is a very complex, difficult, and sensitive matter. And while Canada is regarded as one of the best safe harbors and sanctuaries for immigrants and newcomers like me, and most Canadians are very welcoming, warm, and kind, racism especially in the form of subtle or covert, it still exists. Like Asian like me, when we go to fancy restaurants or establishments and people look at us from head to foot and we feel unwelcome and uncomfortable, or we hear comments or feedback like, oh, you have very good English. Where did you learn it? And we cannot also close our eyes to the alarming reported incidents of hate against Asian, like a Filipino woman just walking her dog in Guadalcantario was approached by a man and she received racial slurs. Or the unfortunate incident of an international student from India who was brutally killed, shot and killed unprovoked near a subway station in, here in Toronto. As Asians, we, meet, we need to stand up and speak up against racism in whatever form, as it has no place here in Canada, in North America, or anywhere in the world. And we should continue to proactively raise awareness and have dialogue like we're having today. And if we can collaborate with institutions, whether governmental, civic, and other advocacy groups, that would be amazing. Because what we all want is to live peacefully, harmoniously, and symbiotically with one another. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for those really powerful words. I think uh, I would echo that. I think many of us would. There's no place in Canada or this world for microaggressions, racism, no matter small or big, however it is. Um, opening up this up to the rest of the panelists, does anyone have anything else they would like to add on to this? Um, I would like to add the following. Um, I think Asians are sometimes under the assumption of not being into politics or being apolitical. Um, I think Stop Asian Hate Movement is our way of saying enough is enough as the horrific attacks make headlines. If we stay silent, the violence will continue. So we're raising awareness and visibility, but we're also demanding structural changes. Thank you, Shotong. Yosef. 
Yeah, I'll piggyback on, you know, I'm seeing the comments here, the uh, the positive uh, reactions to, to Richard's and Xiao Tang's comments. Uh, of course, the COVID-19 outbreak among the uh, the impact that it's had with uh, with the world at large, it's also played a key role in triggering discrimination and racism against Asians. And you know, we know many factors came into play: misinformation about facts. There are feedback loops and echo chambers that get perpetuated by social media. And there's a tendency to lay the blame on what's unknown. And you said it best, you know, Michael. There, racism in in any form is uh, is unacceptable and has no place in Canada. Full stop. So. You know, there are many things we can do to tackle anti-Asian racism or racism as a whole. And I'm glad that uh, we can have this platform to, uh, to have dialogue about it. Okay, we're going to uh, stay with you, Yosef, actually. And I'm going to ask you, what do you think organizations can do to help the Stop Asian movement or uh, their Asian staff in general? And uh, from an individual perspective, you know, perhaps there's people on the call who are wondering what they can do to help strengthen their allyship. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. Um, in fact, that's my number one suggestion is to be that ally. Call out acts of racism, discrimination, microaggression, like, like Richard had shared. Help stand up for those victimized by anti-Asian racism. And, and for ourselves, you know, let's make sure that we challenge our stereotypes as well and interrupt those unconscious bias biases that you may have. You know, these are the, the there are factors that uh, can impact our behavior and our decision making that we might just have blind spots to. So, you know, it's important to 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 learn more and become aware on you know how these stereotypes have developed and whether we ourselves are 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 uh, falling into this trap. Of, of having these unconscious biases play a role in terms of how we act. For organizations, I'll say let's, it's, it's gonna be important to, to encourage companies to advocate for, for the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and, and instill these as, as top organizational priorities in the same vein that you would also have generating growth, revenue or shareholder or shareholder value as a, as a top company priority. EDI should be up there as well. Um, you know, one companies can start off by by hiring and developing diverse talent. You know, there's plenty of business literature out there about how having diversity in staff and leadership is is a key competitive advantage in to, in today's globalized, fast-paced workplace. So I'm very privileged to work for for an employer like Desjardins that has such a culture that champions equity, diversity, and inclusion in everything that uh, that we do. And maybe I'll say too that um, you know, for individuals and organizations alike. It's going to be uh, it, it's helpful to be just be curious and learn more about the Asian heritage that that's all around us. Um, you know, support local Asian owned businesses around you uh, sponsor and take part in, in Asian festivities throughout the year. I read that uh, the population uh, of Asian descent in, in the greater Toronto area anyway, where I'm from, it's over 1 million or that's like roughly 20% of the total population. I can, I can, I could, I could say the same in, in many other large cities and communities across the country. And so with this many Asians living in, in, in Canada, there are numerous cultural events throughout the year in Toronto, there's the International Dragon Boat Festival on Center Island. There's the Waterfront Night Market Food and Drink Festival. That's awesome. You know, there's the Festival of Southeast Asia on Gerrard Street. So, you know, have a look at the community calendar, see what's out there, have a presence, be involved. It's great. It's fun. You know, I've I've been fortunate enough to, to have had, you know, plenty summers, you know, uh, um, doing a, a little bit of a of a road show, if you will, on, on many of these events. And it's a, it's a great experience. And uh, I'll close off by maybe saying that uh, as well throughout the year, there are many um, uh, Asian, important Asian holidays and observances on the calendar. And so for, for, for you and, your, and the, the, the companies that you work for, um, I encourage you to celebrate and, and maybe host some themed activities throughout the year. You know, Lunar New Year is a big one. Diwali is a big one. These are two big events on the calendar, but there's plenty, plenty others. And I think by, by having that type of exposure, um, uh, by, by learning more about everyone's culture, uh, I think that's a, that's a great ingredient for, for fostering uh, a harmonious uh, society uh, that, uh, that we can continue to keep building on. I really like the events with food. Yeah. So I think that's Rice a, or noodle. That's a, <laughs> that's a choice, right? Yeah, we that's a, 
a fun way to do it. And what a great suggestion to try and support some local Asian businesses as well. You can get out and support your community and, and sort of explore some of the different neighborhoods in your area. So that's really nice. I'd like to follow up and ask Michael, because you are a professional in the diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging space, what would you suggest, so for organizations or perhaps for organ for individuals, if you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so allyship. Let's talk a little bit about that. Allyship can really be defined as a proactive, ongoing, um, difficult process of really unlearning, reevaluating, and taking action alongside others. But organizations have a responsibility and an opportunity to change organizational structures that really reinforce structural racism. Um, so organizations can take these kind of four steps. They can really research and educate their employees on what institutionalized raci structural racism is. Um, they can reflect through, um, they can reflect Reflect through assessments on DNI efforts. They can listen to these underrepresented groups and see how they can support them. And finally, they can actively garner the buy in of people in privileged or powerful positions to make sure that they're supporting and taking measures to support these underrepresented groups. I think events and initiatives that celebrate underrepresented groups, such as this, are important to provide as it really provides a platform for these individuals to have a voice and a place for allies to come together to learn and to listen. That's great. Um, yeah. So a follow or another question I would like to open up to all the panelists. Um, so feel free to jump in here. Why is it important for you to celebrate Asian Heritage Month? Probably I'll start, Michael. Yeah, go for it, Richard. Awesome. So two things. First, Asians have been shattering that glass ceiling and breaking barriers. And that is something to celebrate. Michelle Yeo is a Malaysian and made history as the first proud Asian to win the Best Actress in the Oscars. And in one of her interviews, she mentioned or she said that she kung fu that glass ceiling. So that is something to celebrate as an Asian. It shows that uh, we as Asian are at par and equal footing and among the best in the world. And again, that is something to celebrate. And second, which is very close to my heart, in the Philippines, we have these deeply rooted and culturally entrenched idiomatic expression, which if translated into English states that a person who does not look at where he came from, will never reach his destination or where he wants to go. For me, celebrating Asian Heritage Month is like looking back. It's a means of looking back at my roots of where I came from and being thankful for the cultures that shaped me as a person today. And though I'm here in Canada and I plan to uh, stay here for good, the Filipino in me is alive and kicking. And I hope that my story will inspire and resonate uh, others who would like to chase their dreams and be, make a big impact even in foreign land, but still being very proud and thankful of where the culture is and where they came from. Thank you, Richard. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, for me, um, it is important to have representation in the industry and build allyship around us, but it is equally, if not more important to know that there's also diversity within the Asian community. So for, from an ally's perspective, it is about building awareness and fostering conversations rather than compounding any stereotypes or perceptions. But from an Asian's perspective, being part of a community does not dictate that everyone should be the same, share the same opinions or values. So we can be united without being uniform. Thank I'll, you. Uh, I'll add to the dialogue here by uh, as far as why it's important to, to celebrate uh, Asian Heritage Month. And I think it's bringing this type of awareness um, is crucial, right? By recognizing um, 
the challenges, triumphs, and contribution contributions of of Asians that uh, that that have brought into that that and what they've contributed to to this country that we know and love. I think it's for us to to really understand how much more we can do to move forward. We need to have an understanding of how we got here as well. So, for me, that's why uh, it's vital to celebrate uh, Asian Heritage Month. Just want to echo to everyone who just say that, and uh, I think it's very important to celebrate Asian Heritage Month. So we are able to have panel like this to share Asian culture and experience, to reflect on and recognize the many contribution that Canadian of Asian heritage have made and continue to make to Canada. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so I've lost my place here. One second. Okay, here we go. So our next question is for Richard. So how has your heritage shaped the person that you are today? Great question, Carlin. So my, my heritage as a Filipino has largely shaped my outlook in life, including my professional perspective. I am a son of a farmer in the Philippines. And growing up, I witnessed countless typhoons and cat events which destroy our crops and livelihood year after year. But my father, my late father, had always reminded us that not to worry and share whatever we have to our needy neighbors. In 2009, the Philippines experienced one of the most devastating typhoons, which caused massive flooding, destroyed numerous properties, and claimed thousands of lives. But despite the calamity and tragedy, Filipinos were seen smiling, playing in the flood, and selflessly helping one another, which amazed foreign media. And that exemplifies Filipino resiliency and optimism. We always see situation, no matter how bleak and challenging, with a silver lining. And we also have this Filipino cultural, culture of Bayanihan, which is a community empathy, which molded us to always be quick on our feet to help others. And these cultural heritage and upbringing largely affected or has a strong influence on my professional perspective, especially in handling my insurance claims. I see every claim as an opportunity to help and share hope and optimism that no matter what the future holds or how difficult the situation may be, things will get better. And that is something in consonance with the promise of insurance, that insurers will be there for their insured in their moments of needs and loss, and they will put them back on their feet. As such, we as Insurance professionals are beacon of hope for our customers and broker partners. Wow, Richard, that's such a great answer. You uh, you really are selling the insurance industry too, <laughs> and I hope that if I you know ever have a a cat claim that you're the one I get to work with. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sure that uh, you know I I would like to think that a lot of the people working in claims would uh would sort of have that similar perspective so so wonderful to hear that your your heart is really in it as well that's great so i'm also going to ask shaotan is there anything that you would like to add to that so you know how has your heritage sort of shaped you you today um i was brought up under confucian philosophy that endorses um, deference so on one hand, um, before unleashing arguments, there would be a voice reminding me if I would like to proceed by water rather than by fire. On the other hand, since I am aware of the cultural preference on humility, I'm mindful that I will not equate the velocity and volume of speech to one's intelligence because people might need more time to think things through before speaking up, or they might prefer speaking to me in private rather than in a group setting. That is a wonderful reminder for us all. Really, really great to hear your perspective there as well. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll pass it over to Michael. Yeah, we're going to pivot a little bit. Uh, Yosef, this next question is for you. Um, do you have any advice for any young Asian professionals starting off in the workforce? For sure. Um, I'll say do not forget who you are, your roots and your culture, the diverse experiences and perspectives that you bring to the table are, are just so invaluable. So never, never let any sort of self doubt or hesitation creep in. If I can, if I can reference uh, former Toronto Raptor, Fred Van Vliet, he's got this saying called bet on yourself. Uh, and to me that that resonates, you know, this investment in yourself will pay off in dividends. Um, and at the same time, know that we're also here to build each other up. Right. So for those of you starting in the workplace, don't hesitate to seek advice, ask for support and counsel and learn from from each other. We live in a society where we can and should continue to count upon each other. That's a key hallmark of allyship. And, and, uh, and that's how we grow. Love that. Thank you, Yosef. Catherine, wanted to see if you had any thoughts to add on to that. Yes, my advice would be uh, keep trying and seek for new opportunity at all time um, because like I just um, described myself before I came to Canada I actually never worked in the insurance industry if I haven't keep trying and looking for opportunities I wouldn't be here today and also during all my career life I actually I start with uh, auto clans where just like uh, Richard, I, I started with Auto Clan and then I moved into a catastrophe property clan and then I went to asset and benefit and now I'm um, in far on the writing. So always seeking for new opportunities and um, I think that will be great. Okay, we're gonna do another round of a lightning question. So this one's a surprise for you all. You don't know what it will be. Um, your favorite movie. So since we, we did mention Michelle Yao, I think that's probably my favorite movie of, of this year or last year, Everything Everywhere All at Once, really great. So let's hear from everyone else what their favorite movie is. So I'm going to go in order on my screen. Michael, you're up. Ooh, this is so <laughs> tough. I'm going to choose a cult classic, Mean Girls. OK, great. Yosef? This wasn't in the script, Carolyn. Uh, I'll say uh, uh, Back to the Future, classic 80s movie. Good one. All right, Shouton? Utopia. Utopia? Zootopia. Zootopia. Okay, yeah, that's a good one for sure. Catherine? I like Lord of Rings because I, I just like to see the nice view in the movie. <laughs> I would love to go to New Zealand one day. Yes, gorgeous. Okay, and Richard? Ooh, again, as, as Joseph has said, this is not in the script. Yeah, okay, but yeah, I'm a, a, Top, Gun, a Top Gun fan, so I'll go for Top Gun. That's great. Yeah, so in the chat, I see that Sarah really likes Crazy Rich Asians, which also had Michelle Yao in it. Good choice. Um, Zootopia is also popular. And then Ocean's 8, which Aquafina was also in as well as, as in Crazy Rich Asians. So that, that's nice to see. Um, so our next question will be uh, around the workplace. So I'm going to open this up to anyone on the panel. How have we seen the workplace change recently in terms of offering more support um, for our community of Asian colleagues or, or perhaps for other groups as well? Is there anyone who'd like to take a stab at that one? So I can say from the recruitment space, we are seeing more of a focus on um, trying to reach out to some of the, the different groups. So, you know, on campus, there's a lot of student clubs that have formed um, that might be for different BIPOC groups. And we see that employers are more interested in connecting with some of those groups, which is really nice. Um, I would say we're probably seeing a few more ERGs and employee resource groups, but maybe Michael, you, you would like to add something to that from your, from your perspective. Yeah, so employee resource groups are really becoming fundamental within any organization as it's really allowing uh, an organizations to tap into those underrepresented groups and provide 
uh, that organization with kind of a different lens. They're going to be looked at as like the subject matter experts. They'll provide a different lens into a different way of thinking. So employees resource groups definitely help organizations, but it also helps the individuals who are volunteering within that employee resource groups too, because they get opportunities to network, to spotlight themselves, to highlight. Um, so employee resource groups are definitely becoming more prevalent. Uh, and we're seeing it um, with these underrepresented groups, which includes the Asian community as well. Great. Thank you, Michael. Would anyone else like to add anything? I, I think we're also seeing people yeah. getting, okay, Catherine, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with what Michael just said, and I do see like workplace changes in terms of offering support and community of Asian colleagues. Um, like one of the example is that uh, for Wawanisa, we we do have an annual DEI survey. So DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I just want to share some data uh, for Wawanisa. So for the racial diversity, um, right now it's more concentrated on the individual contributor level for Wawanisa, which we have about 37% uh, employee represents as BEI POC, which is Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And for all leadership, they are 23%. And the, for our senior leadership, leadership at the Wawani side, 15%. So that's just some information I would like to share. That's great. Yeah, I think a lot of the insurance companies are really looking to reflect the communities that they serve. So that's something that I've been hearing more lately. And I know from the Insurance Institute's perspective, we do a demographic research survey every uh, four years. And the, the one that we just conducted isn't out yet. But if I had seen the results from that survey, I could tell you that um, currently we're at about 25% people of color um, within the industry. So it, it is gaining back in 2017, the last time we had done the survey, it was around 18. So really nice to see that increase. So that's great. So thank you for sharing, Catherine. So our, our final question that we have is, what is one thing that you would like everyone on the call to take away from this panel discussion today? So we'll open that up to all of you. Is there anyone who would like to start? Mm, probably I'll start, Carly. Sure. Okay, so yeah. I want to say that we have a wonderful discussion and dialogue. And uh, first, my, I have my, my first uh, point is addressed to my fellow Asians. And as I said earlier, the glass ceiling has been shattered. So let's continue to thrive and excel in our respective fields. And for important issues like racism, discrimination, oppression, let's continue to speak up and let our voices be heard. And to my amazing colleagues in the insurance industry, and to those who would like to join us, there is no doubt that the insurance industry has a rightful place and safe space for everyone. Thank you. Anyone else? Who's next? I can go next. Um, okay. For me, I think is um, celebrate your identity and don't be afraid when it evolves. All right, well, short and sweet. Very well said, thank you. Um, Yosef, how about you? Sure, I'll say don't let this message end with you. Um, my challenge to you today is to, to connect with somebody, uh, somebody who maybe couldn't have attended this call and pass along one key takeaway based on what you've heard or learned and hopefully enjoyed about today. So, Thank you, Yosef. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, I would like to share that I think the insurance industry can actually benefit from cultural diversification. Asian culture can provide various benefits, just like uh, my, my colleague just said. Um, so um, because we have a strong emphasis for family, respect for authority and social norms, um, insurance companies actually can use this aspect of culture to their advantage by emphasizing the importance um, of following insurance policies and procedures. Great. And to my wonderful co-host today, we'll, we'll have you uh, give our last words here. 
Oh, no pressure there. No pressure at all. <laughs> um, first off, for those dialing in that are allies to the Asian community, thank you. Thank you for joining um, this journey today. We appreciate it. We know that some of the topics we've brought up can be quite heavy. Um, so we definitely appreciate the work and effort that you're doing. For fellow Asians that have joined the call, note that this is an ongoing journey that we're working through, uh, but don't forget about others through intersectionality. There are other underrepresented groups that really require and um, require our support as we go along this journey. As we progress and have our voices be heard, just realize that there's other groups out there that would love to have our support and need our support. So it's our responsibility to help them on their journey as well. Great. So thank you so much to all of you for your insightful words today. I really enjoyed the discussion. I hope you did as well. We're going to transition to our breakout rooms now. So for the breakout rooms, we'll have our panelists in rooms and we will uh, move you attendees through our rooms. So you'll have the chance to chat with them a little bit more intimately. We'll do this for two rounds. So we'll be in each room for about just under 15 minutes and then we'll wrap up um, for the event. So just a reminder that uh, we do these quarterly. So we will have another one coming up in June. And in June, we're planning to celebrate Indigenous professionals within the industry. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for that one. After the call today, we will send out an email with some links to different resources. Uh, if you're looking to learn a bit more, maybe about how you can support or kind of what's going on in the Asian community or different things that you can perhaps do for Asian Heritage Month. Um, and I would also like to say, you know, I think it's so wonderful that you're all able to join us today. Um, and this could be a first step. You know, this is really an opportunity for you to perhaps get curious and see, you know, how you can push your own boundaries and learn a little bit more about yourself and um, your own your own allyship and what what else you can do. So uh, we'll we'll open up the breakout rooms now, but. Uh, you know, so glad that everyone was able to come. And I really enjoyed the chat. We had a lively chat going on today. So I was trying to go back and forth. So that was really, really wonderful to see. So thank you.